Okay, good morning everybody. I'm uh, Donna Henderson. I'm Head of European Engagement for NHS 24. And uh, I'm absolutely delighted to see you all here today. We're very, very pleased that you've all made uh, the journey here in our very delightful weather. Um, and we're particularly happy that uh, many of our colleagues from across Europe have travelled quite some distance uh, to be here today. So welcome to you all. I just want to say a few words about this absolutely beautiful building for those of you who have not been here before. Um, and I found one or two interesting facts about it today myself. So the lighthouse um, was Charles Rennie Mackintosh's first public commission. So this building was built for the Glasgow Herald newspaper um, way back, and I had to check my notes, 1895. And they were here until the 1980s as a newspaper. Um, it's now um, a, a centre for creative arts and culture, and there's actually two exhibitions here that you can go and look at in lunch hour if you would like to do that. Uh, one of them is on the first floor, and one was on the third floor. And the third floor one is the Macintosh exhibition, so I would take the time to go and see it if you, if you, if you can. Um, just to let you know about housekeeping... Um, there's no fire alarm planned for today, so um, if it does go off, please do make your way through the fire exits. There's one out this door here, and there are two doors here as well. Um, and the staff will be here to guide us out the door, so make your way quickly. Um, and the other thing is the toilets. So the toilets in this building are on floors 2, 3, and 5, so not on this floor. So two downstairs and one upstairs. Um, so that's, hopefully you'll find your way there and back. So, good morning to you all. I mean, as we were saying, absolutely delighted to, to reach this point. Uh, we've been on quite a journey um, uh, to, to, to have this event. Um, I am, along with many others in this room, part of a, a group called the B3 Action Group on Integrated Care, which is part of the European Innovation Partnership. And we're very pleased to have our colleague, Philippe uh, Domanski, here from the European Commission today, who has been uh, very much involved with the, that group. It was set up in 2012 as part of the Innovation Partnership, and it's been running for five years. And the group has really been collaboration of organisations and regions from across Europe who are very keen to share their experiences of integrated care. Um, to enhance not only progression in their own regions and organisations, but also hopefully to, to, to really learn from others. Um, so we, as part of that group, had this idea that actually it would be very good to try and develop some sort of tool that would enable regions to assess their maturity in integrated care. Uh, so we set up on a path throughout that group to start developing that framework and then applied for uh, funding to actually create an online tool. And you'll hear a lot about that today, because many of the regions that are here presenting are actually going to tell you about their experiences of using the tool and what they learned from that experience. So without further ado, I'm going to kick off and introduce um, Councillor um, Chris McElhenney, who's going to give, you know, just give you a bit of context around this whole agenda. Um, and uh, yeah, welcome. Thank you, Donna. Thank you and good morning, colleagues. As was mentioned, my name is Councillor Christopher McElhaney. I am an elected member in Inverclyde Council, one of the 32 local municipal bodies in Scotland. I will also today discuss the work on the European Committee of the Regions and the Reflecting in Europe initiative. It's good to be here as the challenge of an ageing population, the subsequent impact on public services and our collective efforts to ensure the highest standards of integrated health and social care are crucially important to us in the local government family. For anyone who is yet to discover Inverclyde, where I'm from, we're situated just 25 miles west of here on the south bank of the River Clyde, encompassing the towns of Gourock, Greenock and Port Glasgow, as well as surrounding villages. Our location in the mouth of the river made it possible in the 19th and 20th centuries for the rapid development of shipbuilding and marine engineering. We therefore have a very, very rich legacy of cultural heritage, built environment and natural coastal and marine resource. And as coincidence happens, we're actually launching a new seagoing vessel today at Ferguson's shipyard in Port Glasgow at 12 o'clock. If anybody is free to catch that, feel free to join us. I think that's at lunchtime. 
Uh, so in recent years, the Council has sought to count counteract decline and build upon these resources with the understanding that health outcomes are directly linked to the social, economic, deprivation and poverty agenda. Transforming our local waterfront area and focusing on urban renewal in, the hous in housing, for example, has been part of efforts through economic development to improve public health. We plan strategically with recognition of the interrelationship not only between health inequalities and deprivation, but stress, mental health, financial inclusion and employability. The preventative agenda is also at the centre of our approach, which we advance in our capacity as elected local representatives with duties um, to community health and wellbeing. Attempts to grow and diversify the local economy, however, depend on a stable population, and it is known that Scotland experiences the challenges of ageing demographics and, of course, rural decline. Inverclyde is no exception to this, being one of the 12 council areas expected to see population decreases despite the recent general growth in Scotland's total. This downward spiral has been synonymous in Inverclyde since around about the early 1990s. We also have locally a larger percentage of persons aged 60 and above, 26.3% in Inverclyde, and that is higher than the Scottish average of 24.2%, so slight, slightly higher there. And that makes the need for active ageing policies optimise health participation and security and enhance quality of life as people age even greater in Inverclyde and indeed across Scotland. We see that ageing demographics not only present a challenge to the long-term de uh, delivery of public services, the workforce and finance, but to the very fabric of rural and remote communities in Inverclyde and indeed across Scotland and some other communities. At the same time, public services, including in health and social care across Scotland, the UK and Europe are facing com common multiple challenges. For example, national austerity policies and reduction in available budgets gives grounds for real concern and we are yet to see improved rates of investment in the face of that increased demand. And this, with the additional concern of the UK leaving the EU and a possible restriction in EU mobility, in turn restricting our own ability to grow our economy, staff our workforce and tackle problems associated with an ageing population. This local perspective provides the backdrop to which today's event on meeting the challenge of an ageing population population, putting citizens at the heart of integrated care in Europe is so welcome for us. Collaboration at an EU level and professional efforts to work together to deliver the best standards in care and the most innovative solutions for active and healthy ageing, such as those to be discussed today, have never been needed more. The work to develop a tool for self-assessment and facilitate peer learning, led by NHS24, is a very welcome contribution and should be congratulated. At EU and international level, Scotland has a high reputation not only for technology, research and innovation, but collaboration and exchange. The innovative and collaborative nature of this work is a concrete demonstration of that. It shows that Scotland is recognised across the EU as having sector-leading practice in the use of technology to improve health efficiencies. Today's event is also welcome in that it is the first Reflecting on Europe event to be held locally here in Scotland. Reflecting on Europe is an initiative of the European Committee of the Regions to listen to the views of people on the future of the EU. It is in that capacity that I am here speaking today as one of Scotland's nominated representatives on the European Committee of the Regions. The Committee of the Regions is a European body for locally and regionally elected members where we have a formal role to scrutinise and comment on EU policy and legislation and to ensure it adheres with the principles of subsidiarity. Thank you for that one. As a body of 350 elected members from across the 28 EU member states, we work to ensure decisions can be taken as closely to people as possible. Scottish representation is shared jointly by local government and the Scottish Parliament. Given that role to ensure decisions are taken at the level closest to communities, the Committee of the Regions has been asked by European Council President Tusk to contribute to ongoing reflections in the EU on its future to ensure the views of communities, citizens and service users are captured as part of that process. The result is reflecting on Europe with an idea to create the space for local and regional authorities for the citizens to present their thoughts, their ideas about past, present and future European relations. Committee of the Regions members are therefore supporting a series of local listening events, 
this being w such as one, to ask people about the most pressing challenges at regional and local level. It is with recognition that many in Europe perceive the EU institutions as not responsive enough to the needs of people and local communities. But we in the Committee of the Regions are listening. There have already been 90 local events held across 20 European countries, with plans for many more. As many of you will know, all these discussions come after European Commission President Juncker presented MEPs with a new white paper on the future of Europe, which outlined five scenarios ranging from the status quo to a federal Europe. These scenarios, which I have not expressed an opinion, nor do I attempt to do so today, include carrying on as now, stripping back to nothing but the single market, providing for those member states who want to do more, trying to do less more efficiently, or going further and agreeing to share more powers at an EU level. A reflection period in preparation for the UK uh, withdrawal for the European Union on, and in the back of the Future of Europe white paper was launched at the same time. And that is what reflecting in Europe is really about, listening to the views of people at local and regional level to feed into future considerations and options for EU integration. What are people's expectations in respect to the EU? What are the key issues, indeed, the EU should try to address to improve people's lives and enhance European citizenship? I strongly underscore that despite the UK leaving the EU, Scotland needs to be part of these discussions going forward. This is because no matter what formal relationship is negotiated, we still will be affected by decisions taken at an EU level and also in cross-border matters. Challenges are in general, but also in health increasingly cross-border. <laughs> Areas where there are clear benefits for cross-border collaboration, such as procurement, pricing and access to medicines, as well as cost-intensive and highly specialised medical equipment, would be just a small example of what is potentially affected by the UK leaving the European Union. This is where we see across Europe need to improve equity and health outcomes by guaranteeing equal access to quality health care everywhere for everyone. Integrated care is fundamental to achieving this, as are active policies for an ageing population. Well, <clears throat> well, today's event is about perspectives and approaches in integrated health and social care. To frame our reflection discussions, I'll make just a few comments about health issues that present themselves to me as a local politician. The most pressing of these is the issue of health inequalities, which present themselves to me every single day. It's actually probably the number one issue that generates casework for, for local councillors and indeed uh, local politicians. It's widely known in Scotland, for example, that the wealthiest males can live up to seven years longer than those living in deprivation. Scotland also has the lowest life expectancy for men and women in the UK, and that gap is widening. There are actually parts of Inverclyde where I live that life expectancy for men is lower than the state retirement age, which uh, I think can only be summed up as, as sad. Well, we have robust equality, equalities legislation to protect a number of key characteristics, including disability. Recent statistics show that progress in tackling all forms of inequality in Scotland has slowed, and it's actually increasing in many areas. A key priority for all Scottish councils is to close this equality gap address health inequalities and invest in preventative spending. While we are committed to prevention, but also give priority focus to early years, early intervention in later years, a multi-agency systems approach, a high quality workforce and investment in programmes that work and improve outcomes. But despite much progress and Scotland being the first in Europe to introduce legislation for integrated health and social care, we still too often prioritise immediate crisis intervention and crisis-based services. Top-down policymaking can also come at the expense of local government's ability to be flexible and shift spending and, in health and social care, shift the balance of care. We are still too focused on input measures, sometimes without a full appreciation of their effectiveness or whether they deliver outcomes for people. For me, in my role as a local elected politician, public health resources in the round are not adequately set up to address the root causes of health inequalities. As I said in my introduction, my council is working hard to address this, but working together we need to shift the focus of resources from crisis management to the consequences of poverty, preventing it and tackling the root causes. While we are moving in the right direction, lifting more people out of poverty and breaking the cycle in many places, there remain some communities 
that continue to be characterised by poverty, despite our best efforts. There therefore needs to be a more holistic, cross-cutting approach, looking at the wider effects and contributors to poverty, covering health inequalities, employment and employability, learning and financial inclusion. We can all recognise that focusing on one factor alone will not improve health outcomes given the interconnections and poor physical health, mental health is often a direct consequence of course of poverty. We see it happening at a local level in communities and when we talk to our constituents on a daily basis. In the spirit of integration, we should work further to develop a coherent and unified approach also between the actions of agencies and delivery partners to deliver more holistic approaches to tackling poverty and the knock-on negative health consequences. Too many inflexible and top-down targets and indicators can disempower us as local system leaders and managers to be bold, innovative and to take appropriate risks in how we and where we invest our resources. National level should support local considerations around the connections between inequalities, negative outcomes and failure demand and invest in local government as a means to address this. Fundamentally, at an EU level, we need to continue best practice exchange such as has been provided for in the European Innovation Partnership and Active and Healthy Ageing because improving outcomes and addressing health inequalities cannot, in my view, be done effectively in isolation. The Innovation Partnership also demonstrates the potential of technology and digital solutions to address increased demand in health services and make care more flexible. Not only does technology provide a foundation for self-assessment and peer support, but it provides new opportunities for prevention, detection, diagnosis, treatment, information and communication. We need pioneers to maximise fully the use of technology in the health sector. Active and healthy ageing and empowering older people to remain in control of their own lives as long as possible is incredibly important to the European economy and our society. Many in Europe face the double compounding problem of people living longer and having less children, which results in older individuals making up a proportionately larger share of the total population over time. For Scottish local government, this challenge means greater financial pressure on social care, as people live longer, the most common need for service use is not acute care, but rather for care related to long-term uh, long conditions such as dementia. But it also creates increased budgetary and operational pressures in other service areas, such as housing and planning, who must take into account the housing needs of elderly people and have a role in relation to modification or adaptation of accommodation. We also are working to prepare for an ageing workforce plan for large numbers of people to retire over the next few years and ensure that we can attract sufficient young skilled professionals, which personally is why it is so important that we guarantee the rights of young people across the European Union to live and remain and work in Scotland. All while working to provide the best terms and conditions possible for our workforce, which is obviously a very difficult challenge as budgets are increasingly under pressure. Supporting people and communities to ensure that they have capacity, knowledge and skills to be resilient and take control of their own and their family's circumstances and outcomes is a key component of a more equal and more sustainable Scotland. With disabled and elderly people making up a larger number of the people who use services councils provide, they have a significant role as planning partners in, des in designing support services and this, in our view, should be facilitated through co-production of these services. Preventative solutions that focus on prevention and care rather than hospitalisation provide better support for ageing people, especially in remote areas, and it is in the long term much more efficient than institutionalised healthcare in hospitals or being in elderly care homes. Improving outcomes in the earliest years of life in recognition of this effect has on negative social outcomes in later life is also a key factor. This requires action across the whole population, from infants to older people, and requires us to look at reducing inequalities which are intrinsically linked with poor economic health and social outcomes. We are already seeing locally the positive impact of preventative spending and earlier intervention on reducing demand for acute services and tackling health inequalities, but in preventative care and, and in, sorry, both in preventative care and earlier intervention, intervention for older people. But reductions to core budgets with little recognition of the interrelationship between, all local, between the work all local authorities do to reduce inequalities, build community capacity, resilience assets and decrease demand for services in other parts of the system such as health and social care is making this challenge more acute. 
It also has an impact on local government's ability to invest in the voluntary and community sectors, which are key sectors in sustaining and building capacity within our communities. It is, for example, unfortunate so often councils are forced to cut back on their sport and leisure provision, provision pre precisely because of financial pressures they are faced with. There is a clear physical and mental health benefit to sport, and reinvesting in sport and leisure is so important. For us in local government, more needs to be done to protect and improve mental health for all ages through investing in building individual and community resilience. Social care is, too import is, is, is important to support independent living, which is preventative on its own merit. But to maximise efficiencies and ensure locally appropriate solutions are implemented, more needs to be done to devolve resource and decision making closer to communities. This will support flexibility and innovation, otherwise we risk creating a system which prioritises statutory duties and crisis intervention at the expense of preventative intervention and services. We should give further consideration to the role of community development as the foundation of personal and community resilience which will improve outcomes and reduce demand throughout the healthcare journey. This is, a, this is crucial for the long-term sustainability of health and social care services and will require political leadership at both the national and the local level to work with and empower communities. With the UK's decision to leave the EU, we have seen an even greater concern about demographics and the potential impact on local government's ability to counteract a growing ageing population. EU migration is, of course, a key part of attempts to grow Scotland's population. There are already clearly identified impacts of Brexit for the labour market and local economies, but also for service areas, particularly teaching, social work and across the health sector. Free movement of people and the mutual recognition of qualification, qualifications allows skilled and experienced workers, both health professionals um, and others from across the EU, to work in our NHS. Our health and public services depend on EU workers. Without them, our ability to continue to provide high quality health and social care services for the people of Scotland will suffer, particularly in remote and rural communities. The effects of Brexit are also showing an impact on integration policies and community cohesion, a real concern for local leaders with responsibility for well-being. Cross-border care, mobility of patients, workers and retirement issues are just a selection of issues in the health field that will require these posts to be guaranteed post withdrawal. Full service integration needs us to look at service provision holistically. If a more healthy and equal society is also our collective aim, all policy proposals and initiatives should be challenged as to the extent they address and target resources towards tackling inequality. Evidence shows that there is a strong link between low skills, poor education, poor health, unemployment and poverty. More attention needs to be given to the prevention of poverty and tackling its root causes. Ultimately, investment in local government will reduce demand for health and social care provision. If local government was to receive additional resource, we could go further, do more and consider investing further in tackling inequalities, community resilience, mental health and testing and financing new models of social care. Local authorities are the sphere of democracy closest to communities. Local councillors live and work in those communities, and we also rely on the local social care services to help care for our parents, our grandparents, our dependent relatives and friends and family members we know in our communities. We know best our local communities and strive to work with them to produce the best possible outcomes in public health. We are committed to partnership working for the benefits of communities and in the spirit of integration I encourage you to involve your local politicians to be health champions and communicate directly with people and service providers. Um, I would like to thank you for your attention and close with a request for you to complete the Committee of the Region's online survey on Reflecting Europe for which my colleague sitting over here can provide a web, web link or you can Google Reflecting on Europe Committee of the Regions, and remember there are other search providers available. I will also be here this morning and look forward to hearing your views on the future of Europe and to the future of integrated health and social care. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, we will circulate to all delegates uh, the link to that survey, uh, which I think would be very important um, if you can complete it. 
Um, so, just a little word of warning. If anyone actually falls asleep today and you wake up and you think, you look at your agenda and you go, all right, I know where I'm at, what did I miss? You probably aren't at that point in the agenda because there have been one or two changes. Um, so, uh, just to keep you on your toes, I'm not going to tell you what they all are, but the next one is actually a swap in the agenda. So um, we're not moving on to, to Charlie Hogg from Scottish Government. We're actually going to move on now to Philippe Domanski from the European Commission. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Dana. Still good morning. Uh, twice? Oh. Probably, you know. <laughs> well, you chat and <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> I still remember some things, so. Your name? Uh, not, not, not so much, but uh, okay. <laughs> I was asked to talk about integrated care from the Commission's perspective. So, oh, yeah, something appears. Okay. So, <laughs> welcome once again. Um, as, as Donna said, I'm working in the European Commission in DG Santé, or Directorate General for Health and Food Safety. And as you already know, I will say a few words about integrated care from our commission's perspective. So it will be mainly DG Santé's perspective, but not only. Okay. Uh, you see, I'm v very talented. You might be pressing the wrong button. <laughs> right, so don't press that one. Press that so, one. So, <laughs> okay. M maybe I'll work with the keyboard instead of... It the, works fine. So you just need to press that one there. That one, okay. No wonder why people leave the, the EU. <laughs> <laughs> right. so Commission experts at that, 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 that level. Okay. Thank you. Finally, I hope. So, um, uh, I, I don't see arrows I put here, but it's not so important. My presentation will be composed of three parts. Um, I will, first, I will say a few words about analysis of the situation done by, by us, by the Commission, then some actions, and finally, state of play. Not summary, because still there are developments ongoing in, in the area of integrated care. Um, so, talking about the analysis, three years ago, three and a half years ago, uh, the Commission published uh, communication on effective, accessible, and resilient health systems. Uh, it's a document which is kind of guidance, I wouldn't say a Bible, but guidance for, for the Commission in the area of healthcare systems, which in general are the national competency, but still we as the Commission, at, at the request of, of member states, try to, uh, to, to assist them in, uh, in, in this field. So since the title is of uh, contains three adjectives. We, we divided our work into three pillars. One of them is strengthening effectiveness, and in this pillar, one of the areas of action uh, we consider important is integrated care. Of course, one can argue, and uh, it, it won't be anything strange to, to do so, that integrated care also contributes to eff not only to effectiveness, to accessibility, to, to resilience as well, but well, you had to put integrated care somewhere, so that's why it's here. Um, the other action, the, the other analysis we did is a report which was published last year. It's a joint report prepared by the Commission, uh, colleagues from uh, DG, or Directorate General, dealing with economic and financial affairs, and the Economic Policy Committee. This committee is an advisory body composed of representatives of member states. They published this two-volume report on 
uh, health care and long term care systems. As you see from the, I hope you see from the title, it's Joint Report on Health Care and Long Term Care Systems and Fiscal Sustainability. So this time the focus more, was more on, on, on fiscal issues. The first volume presents the analysis of situation, of challenges, etc. Um, all together in the EU. The, the second volume contains uh, profiles or country documents, uh, as they are called, description of uh, health and also long-term care systems of uh, all EU member states. Apart from the description, there are also challenges, and in case of more than half of the EU member states, there is a need of, for improving integrated care. N need for that is, is perceived as a, as a challenge. Going back to, to the action, Donna said at the beginning, introduced to those of you who didn't know the <laughs> That uh, she introduced B3 Action Group of the uh, European Innovation Partnership on Active and Healthy Aging. I will introduce the, the other body, the other group called Expert Group on Health Systems Performance Assessment. The group um, is made of representatives of all 28 member, EU member states plus Norway. Uh, the expert on HSPA in that group also cooperate with the OECD, WHO Europe, as well as the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. And last year, both groups cooperated quite closely on integrated care. And as a result of, of this cooperation, this lovely baby was born. Um, it's a cover note of the report it was published at the beginning of this year, but the, the, the work was done mainly in 2016. It's a report titled Blocks, Tools and Methodologies to Assess Integrated Care in Europe. So the first part of or the title, Blocks, relates especially to Chapter 3, which is on building blocks, system levers, design principles. The idea behind that, that chapter was similar to the idea which was behind the Scirocco maturity model or B3 action groups maturity model. So that there are areas, the fields, uh, which are very important for successful preparing systems and then integrated care models to, to functioning. So in that, in that report we present those building blocks and especially this, this chapter uh, was prepared in uh, close cooperation with, with the B3. Uh, the, the, the report contains uh, examples of good practices, and those good practices, on one hand, they are practices of uh, B3, also the practices uh, in general, EIP, Partnership on Active and Healthy Aging, practices. Chapter 4, which relates more to, to the subtitle, presents a concept of assessing integrated care, also presents uh, frameworks which uh, already exist, not only in Europe, as the title suggests, but also outside in New Zealand or Australia. And the, the, the Scottish set of indicators is one of the, of the examples of assessing functioning of, of integrated care. As a step forward, um, the Commission, uh, with our executive agency, which is responsible for spending money from the health program, uh, we uh, launched a study. Hugo uh, from Optimity Advisors will take the floor. Uh, still before lunch and he will tell you more about this this study. What I want to, to show or to say especially are the, the, first of all the fact that this study is a step forward um, in comparison to the report uh, I showed a moment ago. In the report the HSPA group suggested what should be taken into consideration how assessment models or framework 
could or should look like. Uh, in, in this study, we want to be more concrete. Uh, the, the contractor will propose uh, assessment tool, so really something which could be used uh, to, to assess how integrated care uh, is functioning, functioning in, uh, in every, every place where it is. I mean, uh, the, uh, we hope that the tool could be used by national authorities, but also in, in uh, very local uh, circumstances for, for, for very local programs. It, these are not, the, the, of course, the whole, the, the all deliverables, but I think they are the most important. So one of them, deliverable three, is a mapping of integrated care initiatives. It shows what's happening in integrated care area uh, in the EU plus uh, Norway and Iceland and the number of initiatives in this living document is few hundreds. They are of course of different types from national programs to very local initiatives. Uh, sometimes there are strategies, sometimes there are concrete actions um, and as, as, as I put it on the slide it's a living document so even though in general the mapping is, is finished. If something interesting happens, it should be added to, to the mapping. And the other deliverable, which is expected early next year, will be the tool I, I just told you about. Now, the state of play, and here state of health in the EU. It's a commission's initiative in cooperation with OECD and the European Observatory of health, on health systems and uh, policies. Um, it's a two years uh, exercise which started a year ago in November 2016 when the OECD published Health at Glance Europe. So it's a report on situation health healthcare systems but also uh, information, uh, epidemiological information about uh, health, population, health of populations etc. in all member states. This year in two days uh, two other publications uh, will take place. On one hand, the OECD Plus Observatory, they will present or they prepared uh, 28 health profiles, so descriptions of health situation in all member states. And we, as the Commission, uh, we worked on so-called companion report, report which, is, which accompanies the, the, the profiles. Uh, it's based on, uh, on findings from the profiles. So this is the cover note. As you see, it's still before publication, so unfortunately I cannot tell you much about what's, what's in the, the report as well what's in the, the profiles. More details you can find on the website. But what I can tell you that one of the cross-cutting topics in the companion report, so the, it's integrated care. The topics there are those we, which we as the Commission consider as crucial for healthcare systems in the EU. Those areas where action is needed to, to develop, to improve, to improve functioning of healthcare systems. And uh, as I said, chapter three is on integrating care for a sustainable and effective service. So once again, effectiveness of services, but this time we also added sustainability in comparison to, to the report of 2014. So our concept also developed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philippe. Um, I'll teach you how to use the tech next time. So uh, we're now uh, going on to uh, what was the second item in the agenda, Charlie Hogg from Scottish Government. And Charlie, it's that one there, just in case. <laughs> that one. <laughs> I'll just move you on, actually. There we go. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you here today. It's been really interesting this morning to hear about what's been happening on a European basis. Um, and it's also an exciting time in Scotland for health and social care integration. Um, 
My name's Charlie Hogg and I work in the Directorate for Health and Social Care Integration in the Scottish Government. Um, and a lot of what um, we do, we do a lot of work um, around health and social care integration, but my team in particular work on um, supporting the health and social care partnerships. Today I'd like to talk to you about a few things. Um, why integration is happening in Scotland, uh, so what is the challenge that we're facing, when did it happen, so what's the background to how we got to where we are today, um, what is integration in Scotland, I'll touch on the principles, the vision, the political commitment and the national outcomes that underpin uh, health and social care integration here in Scotland, um, where it's happening, so I'll talk a little bit about the way it's been set up um, and how it's working, so I'll highlight some work on local analysis and data, a bit of annual reporting, and offer some reflections on progress and challenges. So what's the challenge? <coughs> We've already heard a bit this morning about some of the challenges we're facing here in Scotland. Um, as the population is ageing, the pressure on our health and social care system is increasing. There's a number of pressures that uh, the system are facing. So people are living longer, um, and with that goes an increased prevalence of illness, We've got new medicines and technologies happening all the time. We've got challenges to family and carer support um, and inflation, all adding up to a significant number of pressures on the system. Just to illustrate some of this, um, this, is a, this chart highlights the demographic challenge we're facing here. Um, and this is from National Register of Scotland. Over the next 10 years, you can see from here that the over 65 population will increase, but that well increase is well overshadowed by the projected increase in the over 65 population in the next 25 years. Uh, and this is brought into sharp focus when we look at the over 75s and consider the likely increase in prevalence of illness in that age group. It's also worth noting here the projected decrease in the working age population, which also adds another pressure into the system in terms of recruitment and retention. I've got another chart here that I borrowed uh, from a colleague to just highlight addi additional pressures. Here we can see that a small percentage of the population are using a big chunk of resources. So this chart shows one local authority area uh, where 2% of the population are using 50% of the resources. And the next 33% of the resources are being used by only 10% of the population, and so on. Further analysis of this data has shown that within the 2% of high-resource individuals, there are common pathways which are often built around failure demand and there are alternatives that could offer a better quality of care at lower costs. So to summarise the challenge, we've got an ageing population, increasing A&E presentations, higher hospital admissions, increased needs for social care and community health care, all combined with high public expectations and a challenging financial environment, all putting a number of pressures on the system. But the challenge isn't simply one of cost. It's not just about saving money, it's about the quality of care for the individual as well. This is a quote here from uh, Mr Swinney, our Deputy First Minister, uh, from a couple of years ago, where he summed up this challenge quite neatly. To be blunt, if all we do is fund our NHS to deliver more of the same, it will not cope with the pressure it faces. So where did it all begin? Integration in Scotland hasn't come out of nowhere. Various activities, including enabling a legislation that's been happening for a few years now. For example, the Community Health Community Care and Health Scotland Act in 2002 allowed the delegation of functions and budgets between health boards and local authorities, but it was largely unused until Highland set up their lead agency arrangements in 2012. Community health partnerships were largely seen as a health construct, and while the change fund brought together a pooled budget, it only accounted for around 1.5% of the total health and social care spend. Key lessons that we learnt from this activity were that a marginal pooled budget was not enough and that significant legislation, in the f which ended up in the form of the Public Bodies Act, was needed to leave a transformational change. This here is the short version of the Scottish Government's 2020 vision. It was published in 2011 and sets out the Scottish Government's strategic vision for achieving sustainable quality in the delivery of healthcare services across Scotland. In the face of significant challenges of Scotland's public health record, our changing demography and the economic environment. The Scottish Government's 2020 vision is that by 2020 everyone is able to live longer, healthier lives at home or in a homely setting and that we will have a healthcare system where we have integrated health and social care, there's a focus on prevention, anticipation and supported self-management, 
If hospital treatment is required and cannot be provided in a community setting, day case treatment will be the norm. Whatever the setting, care will be provided to the highest standards of quality and safety with the person at the centre of all decisions. There will be a focus on ensuring that people get back into their home or community environment as soon as appropriate with the minimal risk of readmission. So what can we do to address this challenge? We know that existing models of care is unsustainable and unaffordable and often delivering unsatisfactory quality of care. We know we need more activity in the community and less in hospitals to shift that balance of care. This reflects the focus on improving quality and the need to move towards an affordable and sustainable health and social care system. So we need to prevent admissions by managing chronic conditions better in the community, rework clinical pathways to maximise elective and specialist quality and efficiency, and reduce demand across the system, including effective health improvement activity and realistic medicine. Within the Scottish Government, there are three key programmes of work. There's the National Clinical Strategy, which focuses on these care pathways and organisation of clinical care. There's Population Health, which focuses on health improvement and gain, and also health and social care integration. Oh. Yeah. Okay, I'll just carry on. <laughs> um, so what is integration? There's three key principles of reform behind health and social care integration in Scotland. One is around a joint budget, so that's commissioning and service development across health and social care. A single point of accountability for the delivery of services, so that's better coordination and responsiveness to local assets and priorities. And bringing statutory and non-statutory partners together to maximise the use of resources, skills and assets and to plan and deliver services from the bottom up. Health and social care integration is a different approach. It's about trying to get people to do things differently, to work together collaboratively to make best use of resources available in a way that best meets the needs of the service users. It's important to recognise that whilst this is a new approach, it also represents new ways of working within the system. Integration as it currently stands was launched in 2011 with legislation coming into force in 2015. It's however a process, as we've just seen previously, that began way back in 2000 and has gone through a number of iterations over the years to embed and develop the approach. In 2011, the then Deputy First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, who is now <coughs> Scotland's First Minister, made a commitment which still stands as strong today as it did then and continues to be the foundation of what we do. And there are four main elements to this which focus on how services should be organised to benefit the individual. The first key point in this commitment that I wanted to highlight is a focus on service user needs and those of carers and families. So health and social care services are firmly integrated around the needs of individuals, their carers and other family members. The second key part is around joint accountability and effectiveness that the providers of these services are held to account jointly and effectively for improved delivery. Next, that the mechanisms serve needs of users rather than those of the delivery organisations. So services are underpinned by flexible, sustainable financial mechanisms that give priority to the needs of the people that they serve rather than the needs of the organisations through which they are delivered. And finally, strong leadership and professionalism, that these arrangements are characterised by strong and consistent clinical and professional leadership. So the legislation, the Public Bodies Joint Working Scotland Act 2014, was introduced to Parliament in 2013 and unanimously passed as a bill in February 2014. Uh, First partnerships started to go live in a shadow year in April 2015 and in, on the 1st of April 2016 all health and social care partnerships went live. Key elements of the legislation are around nationally agreed outcomes that are supported by indicators, primary community and social care together with aspects of hospital care linked to unplanned admissions, new accountable boards that plan and commission services with a focus on localities, a single budget and operational integration of services. The Act lays out the principles for integration. It lays out clinical and care governance arrangements, brought budgets together and joint oversight of delivery. Importantly, it legislates for joint commissioning and planning at locality levels. 
The Act also lists nine statutory health and wellbeing outcomes to help service users and their carers have a clear understanding of what they can expect in terms of improvements in their health and wellbeing. They apply across all integrated health and social care services, ensuring that health boards, local authorities and integration authorities are clear about their shared priorities by bringing together responsibility and accountability for their delivery. These national outcomes link the outcome for the individual to the performance of the system and are underpinned by a set of indicators. Each integration authority is required to publish an annual performance report that sets out how these outcomes are being achieved. So, by 1st of April 2016, all 31 integration authorities in Scotland were up and running. There are two models that these partnerships can adopt, a body corporate model and a lead agency model. To date, Highland is the only lead agency model we have. There are minimum functions that the health boards and local authorities must delegate to the integration authorities. And some partnerships have chosen to include additional functions, such as children's services, in some areas. Health and social care partnerships are now responsible for around £8 billion out of the total £12 billion Scottish health budget. That's a significant chunk. The Act requires that health boards and local authorities jointly prepare, consult and submit to Scottish ministers an integration scheme which sets out the key ag agreements that need to be reached in developing their integrated arrangements, which includes information such as the model of integration chosen, the scope of functions and services that are to be de delegated, clinical and care governance arrangements, financial management and operational management. All partnerships must also establish a number of locality areas and work with these areas to prepare a strategic commissioning plan which establishes the arrangements for the delivery of integrated functions and how these arrangements will achieve national outcomes. So how is it working? We in the Scottish Government offer national direction and support but the focus of integration is very much on local implementation. Integration is not a strategy or a policy, it's about local decisions and redesign. We have legislation in place and an overall strategic approach, but we don't have a published integration strategy or policy statements. We offer national, and direction, national direction and support by providing a framework for how to do business and guidance on certain issues such as performance reporting or commissioning. We don't offer templates, instruct or direct. We engage directly with and where appropriate provide challenged partnerships. Some of the activities we undertake to support partnerships include supporting the Chief Officer, Chief Officer Group of the Health and Social Care Partnerships, Integration Managers Network and the Chief Finance Officers Network. We also undertake partnership engagement meetings around once a year with each integration authority. We also fund national support organisations such as ISD, his IHUB, to improve local access to national data and to support integration authorities to navigate the information landscape. We need to find local solutions to system challenges. This requires evidence-based approaches that fit with the particular system. It's about local services providing effective and quality care that meets people's needs. It's not about simply increasing capacity and efficiency of services. To develop and understand the evidence and support partnerships on a continuous improvement journey, we've made significant investments into data and improvement support through Source and List. Source is uh, a, a data, some, some work we've been doing on improving what data is available and the main aim of, of this work is to link at an individual level health and social care data. Uh, we've been working with partnerships to develop dashboards to help them access that data and to put in place IT infrastructure to support that linkage of data. <coughs> List uh, is short for the Local Intelligence Support Teams which provide an additional analytical support to help integration authorities use the available information. That's a locally based resource working with local teams and also includes project and data management support, so it's wider than just analytical support. It's set against local priorities, so it's wider than just integration and it's a two-way sharing of skills, knowledge and expertise between the list analysts and local staff. It's about developing capacity to use analysis to support strategic planning. I had a couple of charts to show you um, to illustrate some of the stuff we've been doing, but um, I think it would be difficult to explain them without being able to show you. <laughs> so finally, I'd just like to offer some reflections uh, on progress, challenges and opportunities. To progress to date, we, there are now governance and infrastructure arrangements in place across all 31 health and social care partnerships. That's no small feat. 
Integration authorities are working to build better integrated teams, developing better integrated models of care. Integration is still relatively young, but integration authorities have already been taking actions to reduce delayed discharges and avoid hospital admissions, as well as reduce inappropriately long stays in hospital. There are a few common challenges that integration authorities are facing just now, and we've already heard um, about some of those this morning. One of the big ones there is around workforce, so recruitment and retention of workforce, particularly in social care. There's a, there's a big challenge around finance and tightening budgets. Another challenge is around managing change. Culture and behaviours can present barriers here. And whilst people might agree the change is needed, implementing that change can be much harder and takes time. Man public engagement and managing expectations provides a challenge in some areas around how to get buy into the changes integration authorities are trying to make and how to ensure that services deliver high quality whilst undertaking programmes of tra transformational change. People want new types of service provision but are reluctant, often reluctant to let go or give up some of the existing system that is necessary to make the changes required. And finally, addressing health inequalities and the focus on early intervention. But we've got some great opportunities here to continue to develop the locality approach, to continue to push the focus on individual outcomes and to continue to develop local solutions. In summary, the Scottish Government is committed to health and social care integration and legislated as part of that process. But legislation is not necessarily the tool of choice when trying to avoid a top-down approach. The important feature of integration is the creation of public bodies that are singularly responsible for commissioning services and a single budget. That's what enables local areas to design service lo services locally to best meet people's needs. So the legislation is now up and running. The top-level political leadership is clear. And we're, shift, we're starting to shift the debate from making the current system more efficient towards building an integrated system that can better deliver our broader outcomes. Thank you. Sincere apologies there to Charlie. That's uh, the last thing that you want to happen when your slides disappear. But thank you very much for that very detailed overview of uh, what's currently happening in Scotland. Um, so before coffee, the final session that we're going to move on to is the introduction really to uh, the Scirocco integrated care model um, and also uh, our colleague Hugo, who's going to tell us a little bit more about um, the HSPA work that, um, that uh, Philippe um, referred to. Um, we will make the presentations available and we will make sure that it's the full presentation that, that Charlie should have given, so sincere apologies for that. Andrea? Hello, good morning. So my name is uh, Andrea Pavlochkova and I work as European Service Development Manager at NHS24. And today I would like to feature the um, development of the self-assessment tool that we are taking forward as part of the EU-funded project called SHIROCO, which stands for Scaling Integrated Care in Context. So as the title of uh, this project uh, illustrates, with this project we are trying to address the challenge of scaling up and how to make the exchange of good practices more effective both at the regional local level as well as at the European level. And the main argument within the Shiroko project is that to address this challenge we need to better understand the local context or local conditions for integrated care. And it implies for both for the good practices as well as for the healthcare, uh, healthcare system. So, in short, we are trying to see if there is any systematic way or approach how to basically understand which elements of the healthcare interventions or healthcare systems are transferable to other settings. And we believe that um, to, uh, for, the, for this kind of a very systematic approach, we need tools and frameworks that would help us to understand these very complex processes. And through our experience so far in the European Innovation Partnership, which was mentioned so, uh, so far several times, uh, as, uh, we basic, as well as the literature review, we realize that there is lack of such tools and uh, methodologies. And that's why we started uh, with this work. 
We started in 2014, uh, and this uh, initial Shiroko work initi was initiated by the B3 Action Group uh, uh, on Integrated Care of the European Innovation Partnership on Active and Healthy Aging. And it was that group that kind of like felt the need to work on the and, uh, what we call the time maturity model as a sort of like a conceptual model that would help us to understand how regions are currently doing in terms of integrated care, how mature their systems are, and how ready they are for the adoption of integrated care. What was interesting at that time is that we didn't go for any scientific or academic approach to develop such a tool. We were really looking for uh, kind of like concentrating on the co-design approach and involving local stakeholders who are um, you know, involved in designing and delivery of integrated care in face-to-face -face interviews. And as part of those interviews, we tried to learn how the, how, uh, the regions, um, um, kind of like um, what kind of strategies they developed to, uh, towards their journey towards the integrated care, as well as, also, as well as their future ambitions. And then we tried to look at the way how to basically cluster this learning from these interviews. And this resulted in what we call 12 domains uh, of maturity model. And you probably can't read it very well, but uh, you all have the small leaflets of the Shiroko project on your table, which has this in it, all 12 uh, dimensions. Each of these dimensions then, have, um, then has a proper narrative, what we mean by this dimension. So um, examples of these dimensions include, for instance, readiness to change, removal of inhibitors, finance and funding, <coughs> population approach, citizen empowerment, capacity buildings, and others. And then what is, uh, I think, the most interesting part of this model is that each of these dimensions is then um, also described in terms of the assessment skill, which basically allows you to indicate the level of maturity from zero to five along each of these dimensions. And I won't drill into details of these dimensions because we will have four uh, follow-up sessions where you will hear more about these dimensions and also the achievements of the regions along each of these dimensions. As I mentioned earlier, we didn't take any um, literature reviews or academic approach when we started the work. Then, however, we then realized that uh, if you want to make this uh, tool robust, you need further validation uh, and uh, testing of the tool. And that's where we applied for the uh, funding and got this project Shiroko, which really focuses mainly on testing of this model, refining and improving uh, so that it meets the, uh, so it meets the needs of the potential uh, users. So the tool is now available online. We are in the middle of the project, but we were really um, very keen to get this tool out as soon as possible to allow as much testing as possible so that we can learn from those stakeholders who have been involved in this process of testing and really hear what their needs are. So again, this user-centric approach and, and code design approach is key to it. And I'm very pleased um, um, or actually I would like to take the opportunity to thank you, Stuart and Christina, who are uh, with us here today from the University of Edinburgh, who are doing a really tremendous job in developing this tool. So once you access this link, you will basically ask to answer 12 different questions or 12 different statements, which reflects these 12 dimensions of, of maturity model. And each, uh, each of these statements is breaking the assessment scale, as I mentioned. And once you complete all 12, what you get as the result of this exercise is this spider diagram. So it's a very quick and very easy detection of strengths and weaknesses of your local conditions for integrated care. Within the project, we are not looking only on the technical development of the tool, but also we are trying to support the tool with the various methodologies and processes, how this tool can uh, be applied locally and how it can actually help us to facilitate the, this process of scaling up and exchange of good practices. So we have um, so far the methodology that we've tested, uh, which consists of different, uh, different steps. The first one, which I think is the most challenging that we are also hearing a lot about from, from, from the tester, is around the identification of your local stakeholders. So who are those people who need to be involved in the self-assessment process? And as you are aware, the organization of the healthcare system differ in Europe. The, the definitions and the understanding of the integrated care differs as well. So we are not very prescriptive in saying who you need to involve in this process. It really depends on your local needs. So it's very flexible tool that allows you to achieve your own objectives and ambitions. The tool can be applied individually, so similarly as I was showing you on the previous slides, but it can also be um, applied in the multi-stakeholder settings, and that's usually the approach that we try to, um, uh, uh, try to emphasize. And I will just illustrate in a couple of next slides how this can be applied in different ways. 
So how can you benefit and how the tool can be used? The first um, application of the tool that we've tested so far is to apply this tool to assess the maturity requirements of the good practices. What it means here is that we are not trying to evaluate the good practices. We are not trying to say if the good practice is, is doing well or, uh, or, or not so well. <laughs> we are trying to understand what are the key elements or key requirements of this good practice to be transferable uh, somewhere else. So if you look at this uh, spider diagram and the example of the good practice from Skoltan, it's really the dimensions around the governance, um, funding, and the citizen empowerment, which are, which are key for this uh, process of transferability. Other example how to, um, uh, how to apply this tool is to assess uh, the maturity of the healthcare system. And it's probably fair to say that this is where most of the regions are interested um, so far. So here again, we are not trying to say if the particular healthcare system is doing well or, or wrong. Uh, we are trying to reflect what are the conditions for integrated care, so what are your strengths and weaknesses. So again, it provides regions very quick reflection on where they currently stand. I mentioned earlier that the tool can be applied by individual stakeholders, but then also uh, in, a, in a groups. And here you see the examples when various stakeholders from a particular region uh, undertake this uh, self-assessment exercise. And as it is obvious, depending on where you come from, what is your background, and also seniority level, there is a different outcomes on this spider diagram. So there are different perceptions of stakeholders involved in a particular healthcare system. We've learned that it's very interesting to capture this individual perspective, but what we've learned even more is that the real added value is when you bring all this perspective together and try to actually make these stakeholders negotiate and try to reach the consensus. So the tool, again, allows you to compose the individual responses uh, together and create this spider diagram which shows you the areas where your stakeholders agree, but also more importantly the areas where your, st your stakeholders disagree. And that's where you can focus your, uh, your discussions. You can actually learn about the perceptions of your stakeholders and you can also jointly agree what are your future areas of improvement and future actions for the improvement. So currently within the project we are uh, uh, finishing the testing of uh, applying this tool to assess um, the maturity of the healthcare system and we are moving forward to try to see how we can combine this learning from these processes and apply this tool also to facilitate the training and coaching. Uh, and I will not drill into details of this methodology or what we envisage because we will have at the end of the day the dedicated session facilitated by Stuart Anderson um, trying to kind of like outline and also hear from you how we can take this work forward. So just to sum up, really for us, the key within the project is to learn from our stakeholders. We believe, you know, we, we would like at the end of the project to, be, to actually achieve um, the, uh, to achieve and deliver the tool that will be used by the region. So we are really keen to capture the experience of stakeholders uh, with the tool. We run various focus group meetings, interviews, and survey to really understand the need for such a tool. And from the feedback that we are receiving so far, what our stakeholders appreciate the most is probably the fact that it's really easy to use tool and it's also a very quick process. So once you start organizing your local self-assessment processes, you can finish this exercise really within, uh, within two weeks. Other important element is that facilitation of discussion, uh, which, my, which I mentioned, but it also can be seen as a tool to help you reflect where you currently are and where you, where you wish to go. It was also a praise for the fact that it's a very systematic approach, really you know, capturing all various domains and various aspects of integrated care. And what is interesting to hear uh, now after those, uh, I would say, two or three years uh, of this work is that actually it's quite easy to understand, but it was a bit of a challenge to you know, define those domains, to define those assessments, because as you go throughout Europe, there are different terms um, and different language used in the area of integrated care. But again, based on that co-design approach and working with all the, all the stakeholders involved, I, I believe that it helped us to um, uh, improve the language within the tool. We definitely still have a lot learning ahead of us, so we still have one year for the, for the project, but we are very pleased and proud of various collaborations that we have as part of a Shiroko project across Europe. We have currently more than 30 regions trying and testing the Shiroko tool as part of their individual initiatives or as part of uh, various European projects and initiatives, and I'm really 
very pleased by this collaboration, and I would like to thank you all the regions who are actually many of the, many of them are present here today to really thank you a lot for, on the behalf of Shiroko Consortium for all your help and um, and work with the development of the two. And for those of you who don't know a lot about Shiroko or the two and would like to uh, try it and test it, just please um, uh, get in touch with us. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. And I think you go up next. So we've been working with Hugo for some time um, on the uh, health systems performance assessment um, work, and he's going to now tell us about the next stage that Philippe mentioned earlier, and then we'll break for coffee. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm here in representation of Optimity Advisors and to tell you about a study that we've been doing for Chafea. Uh, and as Philip mentioned, overseen by DG Sante. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief overview of what the study is about and some of the tasks that we already carried out, but I want to focus most of uh, my time today talking about the tasks that we're currently doing. Um, the project is about, um, and at a very high level, the development of a new performance assessment uh, model for uh, integrated care implementation. And the study has two main, oh, the colors changed. Uh, the study has two main purposes. Uh, the purpose one is to uh, review the progress of integrated care implementation at a national and regional level by analyzing the levels of maturity and penetration of integrated care. Um, and the second purpose of the study is to propose, test, and validate a new framework of indicators that would be able to assess the performance of integrated care implementation. And uh, just as an addition to this, uh, this is all in the geographical scope that includes the 28 member states, Norway and Iceland. So these two purposes are broken down uh, into different components and different tasks. And I'll just very briefly run through some of these tasks. So we started out with, uh, by compiling a literature review of the different integrated care models, strategies, and policies in this geographical scope of the 28 member states, Norway and Iceland. We then complemented this literature review with a mapping exercise, including all of the different national and regional integrated care programs and projects and interventions. Uh, we then partnered with the Sirocco project and used the maturity model assessment to assess the level of maturity of integrated care in 12 health systems. And then we pulled on all of this knowledge to uh, select um, about 16 integrated care champion sites to inform the design of this new framework for assessing the performance of integrated care. And that's where the red circle is, and that's what I want to talk about today. So uh, our approach to designing this new framework is um, similarly to, to what Andrew was mentioning for Shiroko, is very based on um, stakeholder engagement and there are three main stages to our approach and how to design this framework. The first one was to compile an extended review of indicators that could be considered as core integrated care performance indicators and as you might guess there are hundreds of these so we had a very big list in the beginning and within our study team and together with our project experts we managed to cut this list down to about 56 and then that's when the two next phases of the design approach start. And this is where we are currently, which are these cycles here, which we call stakeholder engagement cycles. So what we do is basically we work with stakeholders to review this list of 56 indicators, understand their feedback, understand where the definitions of the indicators are correct or not. But more importantly, we work with them to validate um, their inclusion in the final version of the framework through the assessment of four key testing criteria. And these key testing criteria are around data availability, um, the reproducibility of the measures, and so on. So, um, as I said, this um, stage of the project is still open and we're currently engaging with these stakeholders. And this element of user centricity uh, is very important to us because we want the framework to uh, reflect real life data availability, data collection, and data analysis needs. 
Um, and so uh, that's why t to us working in this more agile approach and uh, in engaging with stakeholders is so important. Currently, uh, the framework, uh, again, at 56 indicators, which we expect to uh, narrow down to 20, 25 core integrated care indicators in the future, um, is split into these five different categories. Health outcomes, patient satisfaction and quality of life, use of health and care services, financial outcomes, and advancement of integration. And we envision that uh, in the future, when users use the framework, uh, that they can seamless, seamlessly upload data of the indicators and have that data be compar compared against uh, historical metrics and some other kinds of comparable uh, metrics in a way that, I don't know if you can see this kind of like rectangle here on the right, and in such a way that the output of that comparison is a reg type report that tells you how the measures that you're uploading uh, compare against historical or other comparative measures. And this would be the case for core, what we consider core integrated care indicators. But we also want to give uh, users of the framework the possibility to upload extra indicators, which currently we refer to as gold standard indicators. And by that we mean simply indicators that would provide additional visibility into the performance of integrated care implementation in that health system or project but that would not be part of the core uh, integrated care indicators. So, um, as I mentioned, we were um, lucky to partner and collaborate with different projects throughout, uh, throughout our project. And also, as I mentioned, this uh, stakeholder engagement activities for the design, rather the co-design of this framework are still open. So we would highly value any um, additional collaborations, additional input from the wider integrated care community in Europe, which would basically involve a short virtual engagement with our study team in the form of a phone call or a Skype call, in which we would give you instructions on how to review these indicators. Then we would hold, hold a follow-up phone call or Skype call to uh, review any feedback and understand what, uh, what the main outputs are for the framework. Uh, yes, so if uh, I brought these uh, postcards which have some information on the project and how to get in touch with our team. So if you're interested, I will kind of place them strategically throughout the room. Uh, and if you're interested, um, just feel free to drop us an email. You'll find the contact details on the back of the card. And uh, that's it. Otherwise, just drop me an email right there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hugo. So it's, it's very interesting times for us because obviously we have the development of the maturity, um, the maturity uh, model as well as the uh, performance assessment framework. So they're coming together very nicely and I think it's been very useful for us to try and think about how we make them complementary going forward. Um, we have listened a lot this morning, obviously to very much the European perspective. We've heard from Charlie sorry Charlie, I'll keep saying sorry, um, about Scotland and what's happening here. Um, and we are going to go on after coffee to listen to um, short presentations from uh, several of our partner regions about what's happening um, with integrated care in their regions. So we'll start to get into the meat really of what's currently happening around Europe. But before we break, I just wanted to ask um, if there are any questions that you'd like to pose to our speakers. We have some mics and we will run around and get them to answer. So has anybody got any questions they'd like to pose to Chris, uh, Philippe, uh, Andrea, Hugo or Charlie? Oh, we have one there. Saul? We'll just run back with the mic. Thank you. I'm Saul Wallin. I come from Flanders, so you will hear me a little while uh, after this. And uh, I have a question for you, Charlie. Uh, and, and thank you very much, by the way, because it was a very interesting morning. And, and I'm coming from the Agency of Care and Health in Flanders, so it is part of the ministry. Um, and I was very intrigued by your Public Bodies Act uh, of 2014. I was wondering, 
do I get it right that it is a general act for all public bodies? Um, is it something that, how do you start with it? Is it something that you need to follow it when you see that your area is, is crossing or uh, other areas in, in, in policy, like health and social, uh, healthcare and social care is, is, is quite obvious, I would say. Yeah? But uh, I was wondering, how does it work, actually? Um, okay, so the, the, the Public Bodies Act, as it was set up, and that one is about, um, it's got a particular focus on local authorities and health boards, um, but it does provide a potential framework more widely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My name is Esteban de Manuel from the Basque Country in Spain and also a question for Charlie. You, you, you mentioned that, that one of the key strategies was, as at least I understood so, merging the budgets of social and healthcare. But one of the uh, fears that we have in, in the Basque Country is that merging those budgets might be dangerous for the social service budget, which is always the weak one and, and, and always the more urgent, bigger problems are always on hospital issues and breaking down of very key facilities that have to be mended tomorrow, otherwise, so on and so forth. So what is, the, what is your experience in, in, in that sense? Have social services budget improved since this merging occurred or have they been protected or what has happened with them? Okay, so the... the the idea behind it is to bring health and social care together, um, and I think I mentioned in, in my presentation about previous attempts had large, often been seen as largely health focused, um, which was one of the impetuses for actually putting in place legislation to give a lever to put more emphasis around the fact that it's health and social care that needs to come together. Uh, one of the things that the legislation does um, in the body corporate model that I mentioned. So 30 of the 31 partnerships have this model. And within that model, the health and social care partnerships have an integration joint board. And on that board, that board has a number of voting members. And those voting members are made up of NHS health board representatives and local government elected members. And part of that, and, and the numbers are equal. So the emphasis there is equally on health and social care having a joint governance role within that. I think there are still challenges within it. Um, there, are cha there are financial challenges within it. Um, there were certain things that happened in the budget last year around money uh, moving to uh, focused on social care. Um, so whilst the majority of the budget is not being fenced, certain parts of the budget were set aside for social care, spend on social care. But it's still working. You know, it's it's still evolving. It's still it's still going forward, and there are there are challenges on it. But we're working, we're trying to work through those as we go. Any other questions? Yep, we've got a couple at the back. Diane, who you who's your question directed to? <coughs> Yeah, indeed. Morning. Hi, hello. My name's Diane from Etel in Brussels, Belgium. Um, my question is for Hugo. So it was great to hear such a diversity of speakers focusing on the very practical to then uh, this particular tool. What I didn't quite get, Hugo, was precisely who will be the users of the tool and what its ultimate purpose will be. Uh, and then thirdly, nice to hear that there'll be a synergy with the Scirocco tool, but precisely how do you all see that happening? Thanks for the question. Thank you. Uh, so I'll start with uh, the last question. Uh, we still don't know exactly how the Scirocco and this tool will what the synergy is going to be like. The way I envision it at the moment is um, like if you picture an integrated care implementation journey and you see the Sirocco tool as the initial step of that journey uh, to progress, uh, to, to see how ready you are and then start implementing integ integrated care and then using this tool 
that I just presented to see how you're performing every year against your goals. So that's, uh, that's how I see it, but this will definitely need uh, more discussion because we haven't really thought about it uh, together. Uh, yeah. Um, what was... Uh, yes, that was the other question, right? The end user. So uh, at this stage, we define the end user as any person that's related to uh, health management or health policy making that wants to uh, see how a particular health system is performing in terms of integrated care. I'm going to stand up because I can't see you. <laughs> uh, so uh, the end user would be anyone involved in uh, health policy making or health management that wants to assess the performance of a particular integrated care initiative. Yeah, That's, one yeah. compared to Shiboka, which is much more stakeholder-oriented, uh, much more Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Yes, to add to what Hugo said, uh, since we are behind the, the study. Um, as I said, the, the idea of this study is to go a step further from the, the work of the HSPA group. The HSP, in the HSPA group, national authorities are represented. So there are people from member states, but uh, rather from, not rather, from the ministries, agencies, etc. not people from local uh, authorities or regional authorities, but those fr from the capitals. Um, and um, the idea was, since the, the way the, the HSPA group works is that every year they focus on, on different topic, and obviously they didn't have full capacity to come up with fully fledged tool during that time. Our idea was to, to do something more, and as, as Hugo said, uh, the, the tool could be used by stakeholders, I mean authorities at different levels from national until local to check whether what they do is, is working. It could be also used either to assessing or the results of assessment could be used by uh, scientists, uh, I don't know, media, etc. So we, we didn't define and user as a representative of certain category. I hope it helps. Thank you. Thank you. I think we had one more question at the back beside Diane. Somebody raised their hand earlier. Yes. Well, I just wanted to say thank you for all the is there any fee involved at this stage? Or oh, is there any fee involved at this stage if you collaborate with either of the maturity or the performance projects? No, the, no, fee. there's no fee. We're, we're just very pleased to have you on board. Right. And is, this, is Caroline, is the Scottish government committed to standardise? Uh, are the Scottish government committed to this? Because it would make life a lot easier in the health and social care partnerships. From a Scottish perspective, uh -huh. uh, certainly there have been a number of, of Scottish collaborators on it. Um, Scottish Government per se have not um, said that this is the tool that must be used because it's actually not been formally validated yet. So the Shiroku project is still running. Um, but I think certainly, Peter uh, van der Graaff's here, you, you have been looking at the Shiroku tool potentially. Um, so I think, yes, it may well be used in Scotland um, on a more formal basis when it's available and validated. So certainly just now it's available for testing and if you want to use it. I mean, I think Andrea touched on this. In its current format, um, it's, it's actually incredibly useful for local conversations. It, it wouldn't need to be a formally validated tool to enable you to use it as a conversation point. Any other questions? Anne? Thanks very much. It's about Sirocco. It looks a fantastic tool. And I just wondered if it's been used out with Europe, if you've any experience of its application, because we have colleagues here from Australia, um, and we're also doing some work with Brazil. And it'd be lovely to test it in both of those contexts. 
Yeah, we'd be absolutely delighted. We have had quite a number of uh, queries and, and uh, inquiries, rather, from, from out with Europe, um, Andrea's kind of responded to. But yes, in terms of actually being formally involved in the user testing in the project, we'd be delighted. So, yes, Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Kath Cooney from the Health and Social Care Alliance in Scotland. And just to follow up from Anne's question, has it been tested, Shoko, has it been tested with people who are using services? You know, when you mapped the different perceptions, I think it was from um, the Basque region, I was wondering if there had been any user involvement as well. Esteban, do you want to answer that from the Basque perspective? Maybe Igor can, can add something, but... But what you what you mean by user in terms of uh, health providers, final users in the healthcare professional? Yes, in terms of actual patients or caregivers or informal caregivers, as far as I know, no. But maybe Igor. Okay. Yes. What I meant was people who are using services in health and social care, as well as people who are providing the services. For, for ma the mainly used by healthcare providers at the front line, uh, professionals, GPs, nurses, or, or, also of course intermediate managers and so on and so forth, but really uh, healthcare. One of, the, one of the recommendations of the Basque Country Focus Group was exactly that, that to involve patients, families and caregivers in the, in the assessment team. But, but that's what, what I think, but I want to check with my colleagues just to make sure. I'm just going to ask Francesca Volio from Puglia region. Puglia, uh, Francesca, did you involve citizens, carers in, in your assessment? Uh, yes, well, in Puglia we, we, we did involve, we, have, we had a, a team of uh, 11 stakeholders and uh, in, in this team there were representatives from the regional government that represented the macro level, then there was the meso level represented by the local health authorities, and then the micro level that was represented by professional nurses, the uh, patient citizens and representatives of the uh, citizens, and uh, also some representative of uh, ICT engineer that, that you know had to deal with technology and the co-creation of technology. So we had different views on that, and there was a. Uh, a spider diagram for each one, and that was the big work towards the consensus because it wasn't easy. It was nice to see how the micro level, the meso level, and the, and, and the, and the micro, micro level had more or less the same, were very close in giving their points of view, but be, between the micro, meso, and meso were completely different. <laughs> that is very interesting. Just, just to some, uh, add some points to what Stefan said in the Basque country, we just uh, have uh, 10 people in the, in the evaluation, the assessment. So coming from the Basque health government up to the, which is the, the, the financer, the, and the, the provider also from the Basque health service itself, with some professionals from the macro level for the Basque health service down to the professionals going, working in, in, in the local system and also from the social services as well, but no patients at the moment. I think, I think the very interesting point about it is, as Andrea pointed out, when you're choosing your stakeholders, you, use, you, know, you make that decision yourself at a local level. And uh, one of the real values or, or you know, added values of this is to make sure you do get that breadth of, of representation because where you do get differences in opinion is really outlining the areas that you really need to work on, either communicating what's really happening in your areas because they perhaps don't know, um, and we'll come on, I think, um, afterwards when we're listening to the experiences of the various uh, regions who tested it, that actually that was one of the fundamental things that came out of it. Okay, so before we break for coffee, any last questions? No, excellent. Well, thank you very much for your attention this morning. And uh, teas and coffees, I think, are just about there. Just to remind you, the toilets are upstairs or on the floor below. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>